I believe you all. Thanks, agree. Luca. So in this talk, we will talk about John Reynolds, John C. Reynolds. And well, uh, the title is inspired in this session that was in his honor in last Popel, Popel 2004. So there's also a paper called like that, The Essence of Reynolds, uh, written by Stephen Brooks, uh, Peter O'Hearn, and Udai Reddy. And here I will collect, uh, I mean, most of the quotations that I will use in this talk come from that place, that one I will indicate. So who was John Reynolds? Uh, John Reynolds uh, is a first generation computer scientist. Uh, some would say that he's the, um, one of the fathers of uh, theoretical computer science, and he was a really, really hugely influential guy in, in the programming language community. So, uh, well, he studied at Purdue University in Chicago, graduated at Harvard in theoretical physics, and then he spent some years working for this Argonne National Laboratory as a physicist. But he developed uh, an interest in, in programming and computer science since very early. And then at some point he moved to Syracuse University in New York, and then later to Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. So being a first generation computer scientist, as uh, Peter O'Hearn says, um, some of the f uh, field, uh, fields, research fields there are like those apple trees. So those uh, guys uh, 40 years ago, they were just picking those apples that were easy to reach. Uh, and well, as the time were going on, you really had to develop your climbing skills in order to pick the leftovers. But there is this sign that distinguishes uh, great researchers for the, from the others, which is the ability to, to spot new trees. And that was the case with, with John Reynolds. So his dissertation was on uh, theoretical physics, something, whatever. And some years later, he quoted that, well, his thesis was just, oh, I think, I think the screen is not adjusting the presentation good. I don't know if that would be a problem. Sorry, guys. Well, let's try. So he described his dissertation and this as, as this uh, uh, big number crunching program designed to compute some an interesting quantity in, in some uh, really bad approximation. So, but still, it was uh, his first approach to computer science and to programming. So he had this uh, humility that will characterize him for for later always. Um, sorry, I don't know what I did with here. Hmm. Sorry for these guys. I just... No. Okay. So, his early works um, are in that decade of the 60s. So, one of his first works at Argonne National Laboratory was this Cogen which is what today we will say a high-level compiler. So it was a, a, a compiler generator. And then he wrote uh, this paper, uh, Automatic Computation of Dataset Definitions. So that could be seen as a, a precursor of abstract interpretation, but only if some 15 years before abstract interpretation was a field of research. And then he also wrote, uh, this anti-unification algorithm. So that would mean like um, finding the, the um, most specific uh, generalizer of two terms. And this was uh, just at the basis of, some, of something that was later known as inductive logic programming. So uh, he developed this um, interest in computer science while at Argonne. And in words of uh, Brooks, O'Hearn, and Reddy, those contributions in that uh, decade could, could, only, could um, already stay for, for a well, respectable career. But it is only now, when he moved to Syracuse, that he entered into this stage of really, really, really quality and prolific research, what they uh, refer to as the golden period. So let's analyze some papers in that golden period. So one of his papers in that period was, is this um, Gedanken, 
So as the name in German indicates, Gedanken is this idealized language. So it was a language that uh, mixed uh, uh, imperative features with functional programming. It was a callaway value language and it wasn't typed. But um, somehow uh, it could be seen as a precursor of the core language of ML because it has this um, uh, referential transparency, but then you could also um, use some imperative features, in this case references, and that would be the case later of ML. So during his career, uh, he used types and type theory to encapsulate uh, imperative features and to reason about imperative programs or programming languages. So he admitted some after writing this paper some time later, that he would never design another untyped language. Because, well, the types are the key to um, provide that uh, theoretical strength where you could reason about your programs and then you could do interesting things with programs that has to be used in practice and that have imperative effects and features. So another highly influential paper in that period is uh, definitional interpreters. So this paper, uh, he uses continuation passing style and he introduces the functionalization, but what the paper is about is those uh, metacircular interpreters. So here is the metacircular interpreter that he proposes for some higher order language. And those are just uh, a way of providing the operational semantics of the program. But in this case, the interpreter is metacircular because the, the language being defined is similar to the language in which the interpreter is written. So it could be in, princip in principle possible to, to evaluate the interpreter with itself. And that's why it's metacircular. And what he realized that is that uh, there is a problem with the, um, with the semantics. So at those times, the, there was this controversy with the calling policy in programming languages, whether the languages should be called by, ve called by value or called by name. And what he notices is that um, the semantics in the implementing language get in the way with the semantics of the target language. So you really have to be careful to write the interpreter in such a way that it's, um, let's say, unaware of which are the semantics of its implementation language. So you would run into trouble if you try to implement a call by value language using a call by name implementing uh, programming language. So at that time, there was the work by Peter Landin, who introduced the first uh, asterisk machine for the Lambda calculus. And Peter Landin was a, a, a high supporter of uh, call by value languages. Uh, but John at that time was realizing that call by name was nicer for, for uh, reasoning about the programs. So there is this anecdote where Olivier Danby uh, once he met with both Peter Landin and John Reynolds in some venue in Aarhus. And then, well, the natural question about these metacircular interpreters is whether the intended semantics of your implementing language is called by name or is called by value. So he asked these questions to them, like, oh, so what would be the semantics of the, of the meta language in your opinion? And to this question, Peter Landin answered called by value, of course, and John Reynolds are call by name, of course. <laughs> so there was these two possible options, and each of them has benefits for different purposes, but they could both um, uh, live together. And well, the merit of this paper is uh, realizing of this issue with the, with the semantics getting in the way of what you are defining, and that's a uh, contribution by John Reynolds. So, yeah. Basically, they should semantic no, 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 no. Aha. Uh -huh. So the question is whether uh, the semantics in the meta language should coincide with the semantic of the uh, target language. No, it should not coincide. But you should be aware in your interpreter, in your program, you should use some style that isolates you from the semantics in the implementing language. So you would implement what you want and not something else. That would be the problem. Yeah, so the implementing language affects the target language, and that's a problem. And for that, 
one uh, alternative is to use continuation passing style, for instance. So another paper, and this is uh, perhaps a huge milestone in type theory. So in this paper, uh, Reynolds introduced the polymorphic lambda calculus. Well, well, it, it was also discovered independently by Jean-Yves Girard. So both Reynolds and Girard, they, they came to the same thing, one from the logics and the other from the calculus. So mm, in this uh, polymorphic lambda calculus, so Reynolds took the simply type lambda calculus, which I depicted here, and in the simply type, you just have some basic types, some function types that would be represented with the arrow, and then some language of expressions that contains constants, variables, abstractions, and applications. So what Reynolds added to that is uh, another layer of computation, which is at the level of types. So he added type, type functions and a big lambda operator, which would be the binding operator, but at that level of types. So equipped with this, say that again? Epsilon is just uh, the, the belongs to. I mean, I'm just using his his. So equipped with that uh, polymorphic lambda calculus, you could, for instance, define the the polymorphic identity function. So that term there, uh, big lambda t. So that term takes a type, and what it returns is the identity function over that type. So it's polymorphic in the type of the arguments. Okay, so it takes a big lambda t, and then whatever you put in that t would be substituted, would be replaced by the t in the rest of the expression. So for instance, you could, well, actually that term is a, is a type function. So you could apply that type function to any type. In this case, Reynolds, for the example, he used functions from integers to reals, but you could put there any type. And when you reduce that application, when you compute at the level of types, you obtain the identity, the identity function in that uh, type that you put before. So that's why the calculus is polymorphic. So he went on trying to find a set theoretical model for this calculus, but he couldn't find it. And then he included this sentence in the paper. Well, we must admit a serious lacuna in our change of argument. So years later, he admitted that this sentence was the most fortunate sentence that he ever included in a paper because he really, really hated to be wrong. So at that time, he really had to admit that there was something missing. And well, years later, they discovered how to give uh, set theoretical models, but using intuitionistic uh, set theory instead of classical. But that was uh, some one decade later or something like that. So at that time, he was very happy to admit that he had not. He had, that, yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so, another um, important paper where he uh, pinpointed the expression problem. So, Reynolds was interested in uh, levels of abstraction. You could have abstraction in your data, but you could also have abstraction in your procedures. And there is these two approaches, these two paradigms in programming. So, you have the object-oriented paradigm and the functional programming paradigm, and each of those have a limitation on what they could express. So for object orientation, it's very easy to add new procedures over a set of uh, data structures that you have, but in functional programming is the opposite. It's very easy to create new data structures that comply with some procedures, but it would be very difficult to add new procedures that comply with the structures that you have. So we have to notice that um, the, the term expression problem was coined by Philip Wadler in 95. So that's uh, 20 years um, after this paper. And well, there was like this um, commonplace idea that Reynolds was always like 10 years ahead of anybody else in his field. And there is this anecdote where he was uh, listening to a, to a talk on types and then the speaker said some idea, and then Reynolds was complimented that idea. And then the speaker replied, well, 
I took this idea from a Reynolds paper. <laughs> so that's, uh, at that point, <laughs> the joke started to be, oh, uh, on Reynolds being 10 years ahead of himself, no? and, and, <laughs> and how, how everybody would wish to catch up to where Reynolds was like 10 years ago. And then he, he Reynolds he himself joined the, talk, the joke, saying like, you too? I've long been trying to catch up to where I was. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the anecdote. Well, the essence of Algol, another milestone in programming languages, um, and actually the title that inspires the one in this talk. Um, in this paper, he model uh, the language Algol by using a call by name lambda calculus with subtypes and uh, he encapsulated the imperative features by providing some semantics for local state. So what he did is something similar to um, the use of monads nowadays in Haskell, let's say. So he just equipped the calculus, which is in the calculus you can reason, sorry, you can reason algebraically very nicely. But uh, in the real world, you need imperative features in order to program things. So what he contributed is a way of encapsulating those imperative features with some mechanism that allows you to reason efficiently. And those are the types, precisely. Well, and the semantics for local state that you could add by using those types. Uh, sorry. So. Its paper of John uh, really contains a lot of contributions and some of them are, are really, really well known. If you go to the later Popel proceedings and you browse them, you will find many, many topics that he introduced. And, and those are well known, but in, in words of O'Hearn, what is less known is the, the sheer number of absolutely first-rate contributions made by John across a broad range. So um, there is this story of uh, those papers where the editors were asking him to remove contents because it was too much. And he was like, no, 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 no. We have to keep all these things in these papers because otherwise we would lose uh, accessibility to the paper. So he was really, really prolific in the sense that uh, he could contribute in a single paper, like in many, many, many uh, different areas. So uh, with this paper, we finish this uh, golden period. So this is the paper where he formulates uh, parametric polymorphism and where he gives a very, very intuitive idea of, of the types. And uh, well, the paper opens with a fable in which he, he describes what the types would be. So. The anecdote here is that in those papers previous to, 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 to this one, in those days previous to writing this paper, uh, people were trying to understand types as sets. And the typing relation at some um, uh, belongs to relation, no? And he was uh, trying to push the idea that types are some syntactic structure, but they are not really sets. And in one of those conferences, he was haranguing people like, no, types are syntactic structures, and, and they were, well, but then you have to write a paper on that. And then what Peter O'Hearn tells is that uh, after that event, he locked himself for six months in the, in the library where you almost couldn't see him. And after those six months, he came up with the best paper on types ever written. So we will comment on whether that paper was the best or not, but we will see more on it. So I don't know if we have time, maybe I could read the fable, or otherwise you could find it online. Maybe it's too, I mean, it's not too long, it's just two uh, slides. Let me read it, I think we have time. So once upon a time, there was a university with a peculiar tenure policy. All faculty were tenure and could only be dismissed for moral turpitude. What was peculiar was the definition of moral turpitude, making a false st statement in class. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. Needless to say, the university did not teach computer science. However, it had a renowned department of mathematics. One semester, there was such a large enrollment in complex variables that two sections were scheduled. In one section, 
Professor Descartes announced that the complex number was an ordered pair of reals and the two complex numbers were equal when their corresponding components were equal. He went on to explain how to convert reals into complex numbers, what I was, how to add, multiply and conjugate complex numbers, and how to find their magnitude. In the other section, Professor Bessel announced that the complex number was an ordered pair of reals, the first of which was non-negative, and that two complex numbers were equal if their first components were equal, and either the first components were zero, or the second components differ by a multiple of two pi. He then told an entirely different story about converting reals, i, addition, multiplication, conjugation, and magnitude. Then, after their first classes, an unfortunate mistake in the register office caused the two sections to be interchanged. Despite this, neither Descartes nor Bessel ever committed moral turpitude, even though each was judged by the other's definitions. The reason was that they both had an intuitive understanding of type. Having defined complex numbers and the primitive operations upon them, thereafter they spoke at the level of abstraction that encompassed both of their definitions. The moral of this fable is that type structure is a syntactic discipline for enforcing levels of abstraction. So, well, I guess this fable really, really reflects well what uh, are those levels of abstraction and what a type should do for us. No? So after that golden period in Syracuse, he moved to um, Carnegie Mellon University and he kept uh, writing first-rate contributions, but perhaps not at the same pace as before. But let's analyze some of them. So this uh, using functor category to generate intermediate code. So besides having a very, very um, neat uh, title, <laughs> um, is, this paper is a representative of his idea that uh, theory, in this case, category theory, uh, should um, help to give birth to better programming languages or to advance mechanisms in programming languages and never the other way around. So he said that uh, semanticists should be the obstetricians of programming languages, not their co-owners. Okay, <laughs> and this paper is quite representative of that. So he used category theory to show how to improve some compilation techniques with intermediate code and stuff. And then here it comes, this paper that came like a bolt from the blue in words of, of Brooks and O'Hearn and Reddy. So in this paper, Reynolds introduced uh, separation logic when he was 64 years old. So separation logic has been one of those hottest topics in program verification and, and in concurrency and many, many areas. And he just introduced it, um, well, when you could say that your career is already over. I mean, 64 years old. And yeah, nobody expected it. So at that time, Peter O'Hearn was working in similar topics and the paper just, boom, came, came like that. So this is not the final version of separation logic, but he already introduces the separating conjunction con connective, which is uh, the basis of, of this separation logic thing that I'm not going to explain in detail. So another paper with Peter O'Hearn and Hongxiu Zhang, this time this is the canonical formulation of, of separation logic. And there is a very, very funny anecdote here. So at that time, Peter O'Hearn used to, to hang around with John Reynolds a lot. And, and well, typically he will go to John's house for dinner and then they will sit in the garden over a bottle of scotch and enjoy endless evenings of conversations about verifying um, programming languages and about all kinds of things. So they were interested in, in uh, verifying very, very low level mechanisms in programming languages where you could have like uh, unrestricted pointer arithmetic and you could have allocation and deallocation. I mean, if, almost like if you were dealing with assembly code. And then at some point, uh, John stopped and asked Peter like, well, but Peter, tell me the, the dirtiest program that you know. 
and then Peter went on explaining that program that used uh, those double linked lists in which you were not uh, storing two pointers, but you were storing the the exclusive or of those two pointers, and then you could calculate the next node, and then you had to allocate things in a very, very tricky way, and blah, blah, blah. So the following morning, when Peter uh, found John in the university, so John seemed to be after something. And then Peter asked him, but what are you doing? I mean, so after introducing the polymorphic lambda calculus, you are, are you now going to prove the double short linkage list? And well, after a while, Peter came back and said, well, Peter, I proved it. I have it. So if it was a dirty program before, it's not anymore. <laughs> so that would be, these kind of things is what they were doing, like uh, verifying things with, with uh, very, very low level mechanisms of, of imperative programming. And this is how, uh, I mean, this is to which you will use uh, separation logic to verify those kind of things. So this paper, and I'm done with the papers after this one, uh, is an invited talk at Leaks 2002, where he was uh, summarizing where they got in this separation logic so far. And usually this paper is taken as, as a, the seminal paper in the, in the area. So it's cited everywhere. And as I said, John was like really, really humble and, and never prone to overstatements. So in that talking leaks, he said, well, a growing number of people are working on this formalism and well, we think we are onto something. And well, he was referring to the to the next biggest topic in the in the following 15 years in program verification. So that's a, a sample of his humility. <clears throat> so here I compare precisely, well, on the top, I have this ever paper of, of, on types ever written. And on the bottom, I have the paper on separation logic and I compare the, the profiles from Microsoft Scholar. So I don't mean any exhaustive um, comparison. I mean, I only took these two papers. I'm not comparing it with other papers nor with other authors. But it's interesting to see both papers have stunning numbers. So one has like 400 citations, the other has almost 800. And the interesting thing is that the paper on types was written some 20 years before the other paper, but they almost coincide in the peak in terms of number of references, which you could say is around 2006, 2007, something like that. So the peak is very, very close in both cases. And it's interesting in, in the top to see how, how the number of citations keep growing slightly over 20 years. And then only after 20 years, it reaches the peak. So this is characteristic of those um, really, really deep inside contributions that, that um, John was pushing forward. I mean, it's, it's not uh, just um, a happy idea or, no, no, no. I mean, you could consider them like a classical in a way. So I agree with Peter that this could be maybe the, the best paper on types ever written. <clears throat> so he also wrote a couple of books. The first was in his golden period and they are both like already uh, classic treatises in, in programming languages. By the way, the first book is out of print, but you can find it online in this link. So if you are curious, you can all, uh, we will put the slides online, isn't, isn't, isn't it? Yeah, so you can, you can access it if you are curious. <clears throat> and he also received uh, some uh, distinguished and renowned awards. And again, well, the Lovelace Medal by the British Computer Society and the Honorary Doctor Degree by Queen Mary University. Those are perhaps, well, quite weak. But in this, in this slide, I, I also like uh, to, to point how he was already being awarded with some small things when he was, well, even a grad student in 53 or an undergrad and how he was also going in this crescendo. 
but always with uh, humility. So he's, you, would, you could say he's not like the most uh, prolific uh, scientist in terms of uh, number of papers and stuff, but he's very, very deep in the insights and he's humble still and well, great in a way, at least that's my opinion. So in his honor, the ACM renowned, re renamed the Outstanding Dissertation to the John C. Reynolds Award. And I leave you by, with this um, reflection by Peter Hearn, which tells an anecdote on how he met John the first time as a PhD student and how John took care. I mean, while John was, didn't know Peter O'Hearn at all at that time, but he took care of using four hours to really questioning him until they got to the bottom of his idea, of Peter's idea. And he was passionate uh, of the ideas over any other concern, name it uh, fame or fans or credit. And he was really, really happy when he was learning a new idea. And in words of Peter, you could see it. So that's one of the things that made him great. And well, this is all that I have for you. So thank you very much. We have uh, time for questions. Oh, should I keep this thing? Sorry, yeah, I don't know what I keep. Uh, no, don't, don't close the tabs just yet. Uh, you can yeah. perhaps uh, remove the tabs. Sorry. <laughs> we don't want to pay that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I can ask you a question uh, while we wait for others. You know, I had, uh, now I, I may be a little bit provocative in a way. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, I had a colleague who once said that uh, sort of, uh, John Reynolds was, uh, was working on languages that nobody ever uses. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, I, I don't buy into that, but what would be your, uh, so I'm not talking about separation, but no, no, no. Interesting, uh, which I'll ask later. But regarding the programming languages, what? Uh, what would your reaction be? I would say, uh, well, until a couple of decades, there was a huge interest in model theory and that switched to proof theory. So, well, in a way I'm answering you, uh, we are here talking about theoretical computer science, so it's normal that no so many people would use our languages. Mm -hmm. But in this interest in proof theory and in type theory, like maybe in the last three decades, um, well, there are a big number of functional programs that are now around for, for improving, for general programming, and they are getting more and more and more into conventional programming and into mainstream things. And if you look at those spin-ups from universities or from or those companies in technology that are created nowadays, the number of the, of the companies that use functional programming is, is increasing exponentially. So I would say that maybe that would change in, in a matter of a decade or something like that. It's and we will look at... Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 of course. I mean, there's no... There's, in regarding separation logic, so uh, Peter O'Hearn is now using it at Facebook. So he works at Facebook now uh, yeah. using uh, the tools page of separation logic to find bugs on the Facebook, in the Facebook That's software, true. and happily reporting lots of them. <laughs> so, any more questions? So most of the papers you showed, um, like he's the single author of these papers, um, I think we only showed one paper where he collaborated with others. Just that a common theme in all these applications, but exactly it was basically 10 years ahead of most of the other researchers, it was probably hard to keep up with him. But, um, I, think, I think he got, sorry, I, I wanted to show this. Can you repeat the question for uh, the Yeah, he seems, to be, he seems to be the only author in all the papers that I showed here. And that's true, that's what I was trying to show. And Perhaps, I mean, I don't know, I never met him personally, but in this thing of being 10 years ahead of other people, 
perhaps in a way uh, that was putting him into that isolated first position. But it's true, it's true that he was going alone and then bringing light to many, many, many things. And it's true if you see his DBLP profile, he doesn't have a huge number of publications, but the number of which he is the only author, I mean, it's completely astonishing. So I think, I mean, we could say that, we could conclude that as well from, from John. So anything else, some more questions? Yes, we can take further questions offline. I think people may be a little bit uh, shy of asking questions on YouTube. So uh, <laughs> let's say I'm uh, <laughs>